so uh, Hamish, after that, you guys continued to be red hot, and you know you had uh, albums that um, I had mentioned some before, but they were um, uh, after Cut the Cake with Soul Searching. Then you did the Double Live album. Yeah. Um, you had Benny and Us. You had Warmer Communications. There were just you know too many high points on these records to mention, but looking at that amazing catalog. Can you pull out a few highlights that you remember that stand out to you in, in the studio for some reason? Um, well, Soul Searching was a highlight as, as a record. I think it was like probably the, the next really good album that we did. Uh, it was pretty solid song for song. And, and it was the, the idea of, it wasn't really a concept album, but it, it was a concept of sorts in that we'd had an overture and then an outro. And, and Roger did some fabulous work on it. Um, he wrote great horns and uh, putting the overture together. And then there's a, a song on there called Would You Stay, which has probably Roger's best horn arrangement, I think. It was like a real, almost like a big band, kind of Ray Charles type of type of thing things like that i love your own is obviously a queen of my soul um and then in, into the live album was just a, a, when atlantic suggested doing a live album <laughs> yes who's who's the seventh person uh bruce mccaskill ah bruce, is that like a trivia question bruce was uh Bruce was an integral part of the whole thing. He really got us. To, he sold his Mercedes so that we, we could get to America for the first tour. Wow. You know, and he was around from the beginning. He he loved the band from the first time he heard it. He he'd been he used to work with Eric Clapton uh, as a road manager, and he just finished working with Eric. I think when when we were starting to rehearse at the very beginning. And he just loved it, and he stayed with us. Um, he was there almost all the way, you know, and and became our sort of de facto manager. Um, and uh, was a, was a great character, and uh, and part of the whole package, as it were, you know, on the road. Can I, can I ask you a question about soul searching before we move on? Yeah, sure. sure. So I'm looking at the track list, and um, by the way, I love of your own, my favorite all time, a WB ballad. Um, I'm not sure about elsewhere, but in Los Angeles, I mean, that was heavy, heavy rotation on R&B radio. Looking at the liner notes, you know, it, it says lead vocals, backing vocals, bass, and it has both you and Alan. So I wanted to ask you, how did you decide? You know who would do which vocal who would do bass who would do guitar how was that figured out with you and alan um, well most of it kind of it kind of just came out of the jamming kind of thing not on a love of your own a love of your own was uh was a two voice thing anyway because I, I wrote it with ned doheny and ned sang the low part we sang an octave thing and, and bits where the voices sang harmony so that's where those two vocals, it had to be a two voice thing. Some things that we did, Alan would take the lead. If he'd written the song, it was usually whoever wrote the lyric would, would sing lead. Apart from person to person, Alan wrote the lyric, but it was my idea, uh, my concept as it were, being on the road and on the phone and all that kind of stuff. But I, so I sang that. Um, as far as playing bass went, it would really, we had two bass rigs set up by this time on the road. So uh, on a sound check, whoever played the bass on the original groove would wind up playing it on the record. Like, uh, I'm the one on, on Soul Search. And that, that, was a, that was a sound check groove originally. And then Soul Search and Alan, Alan wrote on piano. So when he came in to the studio with the song, he played it on piano. So I played bass. I, had, I came up with the bass line and, and did that. So it would, it would um, or if Alan came up with a guitar line, 
in sound check, then I'd pick up the bass and, and it kind of worked like that, really. It was wherever the idea came from. So you seem to have a lot of give and take in a way because you would trade off on vocally, you trade off on instruments, and you had yeah. also two saxophone players who could trade yeah. off on the sax lines, and you had um, Ani also on guitar, so you and he could maybe trade off on some things. Yeah, it was always, um, it was very democratic and, and easy to do. Everything just kind of fell into place. You know, there wasn't any kind of, oh, well, I should play on that. No, no, I should play on that. There was never, that never, that never occurred. That never came into the equation. It was just, the, it just, it felt very, everything was very natural. It's just the way it was, you know. That was part of the chemistry that we had when it was really firing on all cylinders, you know. Well, I think a key, a key to your unmistakable sound at the time was the vocals that you and Alan would do, and uh -huh. then also uh, having the two sax players because uh, most other bands at the time had more brass to their sound. Yeah. And so you had uh, War was another band who I've had on the show, and they had the unique sound because they had the sax and the harmonica. And you guys yeah. had the unique uh, element in having just the two sax players. Yeah, absolutely. It was they, they, they had played together for a very long time. And uh, and they had a kind of innate kind of understanding, and and that thing I was talking about earlier on about developing another part on stage. You know, I did a gig with both of them about four years ago, and they did the same thing. You know, we we got I say let's just groove for a while here, and they started to come up with another part. It's just uh, they were they had a just a great understanding, and they could knock things together in a heartbeat. And it was right, you know. They're very unique and special together. And in, individually, too, obviously. So you're, you're uh, talking about the live album, Person to Person. And, you know, I thought at the time when that came out that critically, um, a lot of folks were unfair to it. I mean, I, I don't know what you saw, but I saw some reviews that weren't that great. I think over time, especially, it has really gained a lot of respect. And I think it's looked back at, if not at the time, as one of the finest live R&B funk albums of the era. No. Oh. <laughs> well, I, I think so. I never, I never really, I don't recall ever reading any, any reviews of it, but I remember in, in England, they thought we'd, we'd got very self-indulgent because some of the songs went a bit long. You know, I think they went a bit long for some people, but. I think that was part of the live experience too, because everybody was in the groove and dancing and having a good time. So it just extended, and uh, we did edit a little bit because uh, some things were just too long, and and uh, and there were some dead spots where we were in between what was going to, you know, what was going to happen next <laughs> and what had just happened. Yeah, and you're you're talking. There was an 18 minute version of Pick Up the Pieces on there. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, that was uh, round about. It was round about when punk was happening in England when that came out, and uh, we got the self-indulgent tag. You know, it wasn't a three-minute thrash. <laughs> but you had some great breakdowns and solos in, in that eighteen minutes. Oh yeah, yeah. Just let everybody really get a chance to play. That was always the ethos. Uh, everybody really got a chance to play. And that's something that I've kept with me, whatever I do, whatever, you know, whoever's playing with me, everybody in the band on the gig has the latitude to, uh, you know, to express themselves. And there's, there's enough room to solo for everybody to get inside of whatever the tune is to express themselves. I think it's really important. So after that, you collaborated with Benny King, the great soul singer. Um, how did you connect with him, and, and what do you remember about those sessions? Well, that, that came from Jerry Greenberg, who was uh, one of the presidents of at, uh, one of the Veeps at, at Atlantic at that time. He had a song called Star in the Ghetto that he wanted to do with Benny as a single. And Benny had had a supernatural thing like a year, two years before. So he was kind of 
he had his, his career was on the upswing and uh, um, so the idea was to go and make that single with Benny uh, and we needed a b-side so I can't remember what we cut as the b-side but then we were kind of in the middle of cutting warmer communications uh, and we'd kind of stalled a little bit so having Benny come in was like a breath of fresh air and we cut the two songs and then I said well, let's keep going this is great you know and people kept suggesting uh, other songs like Jerry Greenberg came up with the foreigner song uh, Fool For You Anyway and then somebody we uh, the, the Ned Doheny song Get It Up For Love and quickly very quickly we had uh, Keeping It To Myself was a no-brainer that just fit right and uh, in about three weeks, we had an album, and it was it was great. We had Luther Vandross, um, an old friend, Alec Lidgerwood, who used to sing with Santana, came in, and and we had other friends come in and play, and it, it was just a blast to make a record. And with Benny as well, who'd been a you know what is soul, and we had to do that. That was actual fact. That was the first thing that. Robbie, I heard Robbie McIntosh play was what his soul when he came back to Glasgow uh, back when he was a teenager and everybody was trying to figure out how to play that beat Robbie had it down <laughs> mm -hmm. so that, that we had to do that so it was there was a lot of uh, it was a lot of love for that project yeah I, I imagine you must have had a blast doing it because you could kind of in a way <clears throat> let your hair down in a way you know, not be under the pressure maybe of an AWB record as it would be and just kind of work with a great legend, basically. Yeah, it was great. It gave us a chance just to be players, which we all wanted to be anyway, which we did inside of the band. But it, it took the focus, uh, the direct focus away from us just, just for a minute. And for me, it was always a Benny King record. It wasn't really Benny and us. It was like, well, it, well, it was, but... It was kind of marketed. Uh, some AWB fans were, were kind of dis were kind of slightly miffed that they thought it was an AWB album, but it wasn't. It was really Benny's record. It was, although the message is a fierce groove on that record. That song really percolates. <laughs> it was. It was a great. It was a great project. It was a fun record to do, and it, it allowed us to to kind of. Just move on. Did you guys actually do any uh, uh, shows or performances with Benny? Yeah, we, mainly in mainly in Europe. When we we came over here in 1977 to do Montreux, and there was uh, uh, the Atlantic Family live at Montreux was the record that came out of that. It was a double live album where uh, Herbie Mann was kind of in charge. And it was uh, the, the Sunny Fortune, and the Breckers came and played, Richard T, uh, European acts like Klaus Doldinger was signed to Atlantic over here. And, um, and uh, I can't remember all the personnel, but uh, Benny came over and did that. And we did uh, a live version of Everything Must Change with Luther Vandross and his girls were on it as well. Um, and, we, and there was a 20-minute version to pick up the pieces that Arif wrote a wonderful chart for, which uh, has become a big band uh, staple now. And, and when it, any time I've got more than two horns in the band, I play that Arif's big band version of that because it's great. And that, that uh, live, uh, the Atlantic family live at Montreux, that, that's on that. And as a... Great, some great solos. Randy Brecker, Michael Brecker, great Richard T solo, and the ba the we were just the rhythm section, and we were all on fire. It was it was like it. It was a great week. We had a great week in Montreux. We played live. Everybody sat in with other people, and we made this record. It's just just great time. And then we we carried on through Europe, and Benny joined us and did a his uh, little spot in the middle of our set, middle of our show. And then we, we did do some shows in America, but not many. 
I just caught a clip on YouTube of uh, the band from the mid seventies period at Montreux, and um, it was just you guys. It wasn't this tour you're talking about. But um, while we're talking about concerts, I wanted to ask you about you know one or two of your most unforgettable memories from the road, whether it was um, you know playing with someone special, whether it was you know, something unfortunate that happened or, um, you know, whatever the reason is, what are a couple of uh, stories from the road in the seventies that really stand out in your mind? Um, oh, there are many, there's so many, uh, wow, God, that's, it's a hard one to do that. We, 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 I remember we were we were playing in DC at some Coliseum around it must have been about seventy seven or seventy eight, and we thought we'd left in plenty of time, but we got caught up in the crowd going to the concert, and it, it was the the limousine the windows were down people were high fiving us and <laughs> trying to get into the car and, and we had it took us we were late getting on stage because it took so long getting through the crowd and the crowd was late getting there. And it was just it was just a great moment because the spirit of it was lovely. Everybody, hey, yeah, okay, let's go. Go on. Where, what do you mean? Where? Why aren't you on stage? <laughs> Get in there. Uh, things like that. Work. Uh, the first two we did as a headliner, we had Les McCann opening for us because we got to choose our opening act, and and we thought, you know, Les would be great. And um, that was an education every every night watching him. From the side of the stage, he was great, one of the greats, and uh, and he'd take us. We got to like places like Buffalo, where he came from, and he'd take us around. Oh, we used to eat in there, and Roy McCurdy used to work there, and so on. And, and he, he was uh, madly snapping away with his Nikon the whole time, things like that. Uh, and then when we played the Hollywood Palladium in L.A. Uh, around about 77, I think, I think it was ha Halloween 77, and Marvin Gaye had introduced himself by that time. Um, he loved the band, and uh, he had us out to his house for dinner, and we'd been hanging out a little bit, and he came down to the show, and he joined, heard it through the grapevine as the encore. That was our staple encore right through that whole time period, and he joined us on stage for that. That was... Wow. Uh, Serious highlight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wonderful. Did you guys? Uh, did you guys? Tend, did, I'm sorry. Did you guys tend to be hellraisers on the road, or, or did you behave yourselves? There were crazy moments. Uh, there's always crazy moments when when, uh, when things are going well. There are crazy moments because you get overexcited, and then when things are going bad, you get angry. You know, when there's a one night, uh, we were in Kansas City, and the the monitor system went down when we hit the stage, uh, and it made for a really difficult show because we, we couldn't hear each other properly, and uh, it was just hell. Mm. But but we went down great, you know, and every we came off, and we said that was so great, that was so great. Was, you don't understand. It was so depressing. <laughs> And you go back to your hotel, and you know, ah, it's hard. I, I, back then, I found it very hard to come out of those those things when something was that kind of. Uh, you learn to roll with the punches as you get older, and it's like, okay, that was it. It's over now. You know, if like I, I sang something that was a little off key, it would I'd get kind of bent out of shape for the rest of the night. But now, it's gone. You know, you sing a, a bad note, it's gone. You try and avoid singing those bad notes. You know, you just try and make it as good as you can all the time. You guys also did a lot of TV appearances, um, and you know what stood out to me uh, among others is that on Soul Train, you guys played live. I'm pretty sure, whereas a lot of other yeah. acts were lip syncing. So, you know, how did you did you insist on that? Well, we did. We discovered that they did do live performances because we saw some Smokey Robinson did a great thing when cruising came out um, where he played live with a small band and we thought yeah oh they're allowed the and it sounded great because they they had 
good good people doing doing the sound. And then when we did it uh, live, Arif and Gene Paul flew out from New York, who who recorded the albums anyway. So we knew we had somebody in the well. Every TV that we did, Gene came out to kind of supervise, and Arif was there as well to make sure they they really captured what we were doing. But uh, we we did insist we wanted to play live because we wanted it to be real, and there was yeah. Then there was no no nobody could say well you weren't playing live. You you do you're not that you that wasn't you. <laughs> you know it had to be real. It had to be right. We owed that to the audience actually. Speaking of the audiences, you know, when you guys came out, you sounded so authentically R&B and so funky. Even though you had the name of Average White Band before I saw a picture, I still was asking myself, is that just an ironic thing? Are they really a white band? Are they not? It was such a kind of enigmatic mystery at the time uh, until you guys really established, you know, your your status and, and your, your identity uh, here. Yeah. What was it like with audiences uh, initially and as it progressed, you know, in terms of the composition of the audiences uh, racially and, um, you know, your, your acceptance with those audiences? Well, it was, it was pretty much, most places we played, it was pretty much 50-50 black and white audience. And uh, except for DC, where it's like a, there's a huge african-american population so it was uh, there was a lot more of a black audience there than in places like philly but um it was just uh, i don't know from the very beginning from that concert I, on the very first tour when we were opening for bb you know we did a our 45 minutes and we were accepted we knew we'd been accepted and it just it kind of carried on and snowballed like that and and the record broke, pick up the pieces broke through black radio, and that was Jerry Wexler's strategy as well. He went, he took, he sent them out with no, no pictures, you know, it was just a white label thing, because um, he knew he could, he was sure he could break, he could break it f through black radio, and then it crossed over to pop. Once we started to get people on American Bandstand using it for the dance contest, and. and uh, and the audiences from, we weren't touring at, at that point as the record was was breaking because we were working on Cut the Cake. So we didn't really tour until that following summer. And, uh, and we, the audience was just, there they were. And they were cheering and clapping and dancing and singing and, it was uh, it was just totally total acceptance, and we were, you couldn't be <laughs> you could not be like overjoyed by it. You know. I remember they were calling it blue eyed soul. Yeah, that was a, they coined that term. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that was I think the rascals kind of the rascals before us, and I, I think Hall and Oates got a bit of the blue eyed soul tag as well. We we just. We were just riding on their coattails. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that, but you know, I, I recently looked at a old picture of you, and man, you had the wild mane of hair. I got to tell you, it was really out yeah, there. Yeah. So, uh, you guys kind of had like you know a bit of an afro going anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, I trimmed down quite a bit. I calmed down a bit by the time the white album came out, but uh, yeah, back in the early days, it, there was a lot of a lot of hair. <laughs> it's just the way it was the way it, the way it grew it grew out like that so Hamish the warmer communications came out 78 and uh, had a great lead track your love is a miracle I remember yeah. when that when I first heard that it really took me aback a bit because it is so like slowed down and yeah. and I'm like this is funky I think but I don't know <laughs> if I've ever heard funk this slow before you can't really dance to it it's definitely for listening but um it was like you know powerful yeah that's a great groove that uh, uh, somebody sent me uh, 
a friend, a drummer friend, Jeff Dugmore, sent me a, a, a CD that he had taken, uh, a recording from a, a, a radio, live radio from Belmont Racetrack from that year when we just started performing Your Love Is A Miracle. And the version on that live thing is just, uh, you know, because I don't listen to the old records, but the live version from that, from that show is just great. And I, I, I kind of sent it off to the guys and check this out. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a really good live recording, actually, that, that whole show. Uh, we, were, we were at a good peak around about seven, late 77, 78. But that groove, yeah, that's a stinker of a groove, that. Uh, <laughs> Is there anything else about that particular record or those sessions that stands out to you? Um, well, again, Love's, Your Love is a Miracle was a, was a sound check groove that came from, that we just expanded. Um, there were uh, little, uh, little additions to that record. Like we had this kind of reggae track, Warmer Communications. And uh, I'd been on holiday down in the Caribbean and I heard the tree frogs. And I thought, and I'd heard music outside with the tree frogs in the background, and it, they really just seemed to work together. So we had to have tree frogs on this track. So I went down to Bermuda uh, on a weekend, and I took a, a good microphone with me and a, and a great cassette recorder, and I wandered around the hotel beach recording these tree frogs. Mm -hmm. And uh, they started paging like some... I had a beard at the time as well, so I looked like some crazy anthropologist, like mm -hmm. stumbling along the beach. They actually started paging me as Dr. Stewart. <laughs> What's the thought I was? Anyway, I came back and used that, and we used, we went out, Arif went out with his son and recorded some, uh, some street noise at Columbus Circle, which we used on another track, uh, Big City Lights. You can hear the traffic on Columbus Circle and police sirens and stuff like that. So we, we played around a little bit on on that with some other stuff, some atmospherics. That was fun. And also there's a track called She's a Dream that was a kind of samba thing that, that uh, was uh, a little bit of a departure for me. I was really getting interested in Brazilian music. And, and that was another thing, that another track that Roger wrote a beautiful horn arrangement for. And Mike Brecker plays some fantastic flute over the end of it. That was another great moment. So the next year, Field No Fret came out, and it seems like you kind of parted ways with the reef. What what happened there? You, I think that was self-produced by the band. What what were the yeah. changes well, going on then, and what went into that record, uh, Hamish? Well, we decided we were kind of drawing and moving on and, and there's a, a sort of a sort of a group decision to produce the next record ourselves we wanted to wanted to try that Although, uh, i kind of wished with hindsight that uh, we'd kept a reef involved a reef and gene to mix the record once we recorded it because it became the mixing thing was really difficult with everybody in the studio trying to mix by committee six people was you know, it was kind of difficult. Um, and probably the only time that we had any sort of, well, it wasn't a disagreement, but it was it was just harder because everybody had an opinion about it. If Arif and Gene had mixed it, that would have been fine, you know. But but it was a conscious decision to do that and, and also to go away by ourselves with Gene to record. Um, because we hadn't, um, like with the White Album, we'd written the songs together in one place and uh, had great results. And with Soul Searching, a lot of the stuff, the unfinished stuff we'd constructed in the studio. So we figured if we go away with bits and pieces of songs and some finished songs and put the record together in a place where there's no distractions, then get out of New York, get away from where we, we'd got comfortable and put ourselves in a different situation, we'd come up with a better record. And I think we did. I think that was the last really, really solid record that we did together. 
Um, um, and song for song is pretty solid, I think. Yeah. Compositionally and performance-wise, it's, it's good. Even uh, that record had some different kinds of rhythmic things going on. I mean, the title track yeah, was a little bit different. That was partially being in, in the Bahamas as well. We were working at Compass Point at Lightwell's studio, and uh, there have been a couple of records made there just previously. Uh, Toots and the Maytals had done their last album there, and there was another group, there's a name I can't remember, another Jamaican group, who, an album called 106 in the Shade or 102 in the Shade. And there were some other reggae things coming through that were being mixed in the other room and mastered. So we, and that island, we got into that kind of island vibe and we came up with some other, some different, some different grooves. It was definitely influence coming from somewhere else. It got us out of, uh, more an island thing was happening. Yeah. <laughs> With Professor Stewart. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Steve came up with that fantastic Feel No Fret groove. It's just, that was another uh, another high point. That's, that's an interesting beat, that. Yeah, yeah. It's a hybrid reggae kind of up-tempo dance thing. So Hamish, big changes were afoot after that. Um, you yeah. guys changed labels uh looks like um yeah you went to arista so um and shine was the next record yeah um a lot of different people involved and you know to me it definitely was a more polished kind of a more popish kind of sound so what transpired you know in changing labels changing people what was going on well i think uh, changing labels was was our first mistake <laughs> <laughs> But everybody felt like we needed a change, but I think a change of label, maybe just a change of a change of attitude within ourselves might have been might have been better. And, uh, and we did actually start that record off uh, on Atlantic and lost some four tracks, which were really good, which a couple of things we'd co-written with David Foster. And a couple, something Alan had written, something I'd written, that became Volume Eight on Atlantic. Um, four tracks plus some older reissues that became Volume Eight. And uh, I think once we switched, uh, we were working with David Foster and we were working in LA, and it, it had a different sound and and it wasn't. It wasn't really us, and, and I think David started to pull in some some of his friends to play on on tracks, and it it it, it, it was starting to get away from us. I think the group was starting to sort of not disintegrate, but the the closeness that we had in the chemistry was starting to dissolve a bit uh, by having other people and too many other people involved. Um, and we just we made the best that we could of it, and I think it did wind up a more popular uh, kind of LA sounding record. It wasn't very gritty. Uh, I think the, the the New York records were much, were much grittier. The the drum sound I didn't really like. And um, what you're going to do for me? The version on that record I can't even listen to. I think it's you know. It's just so, it's kind of soggy, yeah. <laughs> and, and that was when, when we, Steve and I cut a much better version with Shaka about a year later. It was a much more, the, the, the track had all the fire that was missing, that I felt was in the song that was missing from the way we played it as a group. Well, a, a reef helped with that one. Yeah, a reef did, yeah. absolutely. Um, and and the other players, David Williams on guitar was burning, and and uh, um, Anthony Jackson on bass. You know, it was a it was a different, it was a whole other attitude. Plus Shaka's vocal, it was it was slight, but generally the feel of the song was much more the way I'd originally heard it. That's the one. <laughs> that was a that was a great project. 
That was a match made in heaven for me because, you know, she's my favorite vocal, a uh, female vocalist of all time. And then to get with you guys, that was tremendous. Well, we, that was the third album we did with Shaka. And that was another one of the things that Steve and I had done outside of the, of the band with a reef was, was always so much fun. And with, with other with great players like Anthony Jackson and David Williams and Richard T and people like that, you know, it was, yeah, <laughs> playing music. So on Shine, before we uh, leave that one, uh, that had on it, Let's Go Around Again, which was yeah. a hit of sorts. And, you know, but the David Foster thing, you know, he was so much more, in my mind, so much more kind of pop and mellower and kind of, uh, you know, not rough around the edges at all. And, yeah. you know, how did you uh, connect with him to kind of take that part of the project? Was it, well, we, was we it know, Cl Clive Davis have anything to do with that? Or? We'd known David for quite a few years. He used to come around and to Brian, Brian Ru and Brenda Russell were friends of ours. And we used to go around to their house and sit around the piano and sing and have a bit of a social musical evening, having, having a few drinks. And David would play piano. That's when we met him. And uh, he'd started to carve out a little, uh, quite a niche for himself by the time 79 rolled along and we started to work. Uh, we wanted to write with David. Uh, and then he it just kind of fell into the producer role because uh, we'd moved to Arista and Clive Davis decided that, oh yeah, David would be good. Okay, let's do that. And the funny thing was, uh, Let's Go Round Again is probably the poppiest song on that record, but David didn't get it. I mean, we more or less produced that. Mm. Roger wrote that beautiful string and ho the strings and horns, and David wasn't much involved in that track at all, really. Strangely enough, which which didn't it didn't mean much in America, but it was it's a perennial here in England. It was a big hit here, and it's. It was the next generation that caught on to it as well, 1980. It's funny. It's, uh, it's something that, that's uh, we're probably more, most known in England for Pick Up the Pieces and Let's Go Around Again. <laughs> the, the, the six years between. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Apart from the hardcore fans, obviously, you know, that know everything. So you actually uh, took two years, which was a long time for you guys then, to come up with what would be your final uh, album together. Um, yeah. And that was Cupid's in Fashion in 1982. Uh, title track had some success. But um, you know what was going on then, and, and why did you guys end up going your separate ways? Um, well, it was we were kind of struggling on. I think the... As I was saying before, the chemistry, I think, had started to dissipate and, and we weren't really kind of on the same page about everything anymore. And plus, Clive Davis wasn't really helping because he didn't, underst he didn't really understand what we were about. He didn't understand the way we operated and, and how the music that we created came together. And... Some of the songs that he sent us were just laughable. You know, there were things that sort of Barry Manilow cast offs, mm -hmm. <laughs> things that we would never have dreamt of uh, of performing. So there was there was a there was a kind of quest on to find songs. I made a couple of trips to LA to go around all the publishers I knew and try and find songs. Alan and I were trying to write songs and. Uh, Individually and collectively, we were trying to come up with something. Plus, uh, trying to f find the next producer. Uh, we Bob Ezrin wanted to produce the uh, the the band, and we wanted to work with him. That would be interesting. He just, he just finished doing the Wall with the Floyd, which was a huge hit, uh, like about a year before or two years before. And um, and Clive said, "Well, what's he done lately?" <laughs> and unfortunately, that's so unfortunately that didn't happen. I think if we'd worked with Bob, we'd have come up with something that was more like us 
and we would have taken the time to get to get it right uh, and we wound up uh, with Dan Hartman producing and and Dan kind of kind of got what we were about but he was he, again he was much more he was more pop than than David Foster even so it, it became it became a difficult record to make not that Dan was difficult but it was just difficult because we were we were kind of disintegrating I think uh, because we weren't creating as much together collectively because that was our strength that was where all the stuff that really lasted came from and the songs that we'd written while we were doing that as well you know well while we were still collectively together so that that was it's a shame that was our poorest effort i think and it um where where, where were most of you living at the time uh in new york um we were all in new york except roger roger was still in la roger lived in la most of the time but uh, between new manhattan and connecticut um and we recorded in new york we recorded at hit, the hit factory but it just it was one of those um Everybody re tried real hard to make it happen, but you know it's just something when it's when it's when you're trying and it's not working, then something's wrong. And we carried on for a while promoting the record after it came out and it, and playing gigs, and uh, it just wasn't uh, it wasn't there anymore. You know, I talked to so many um, bands from back then, R&B bands, who worked with Clive Davis. And it's almost like all the same story, you know, that um, he didn't really get them, you know, from an R&B standpoint, yeah. and that he tried to sort of, you know, water them down, make it sugary, it didn't fit. And, you know, it's just a shame with a lot of the acts at that time. Yeah, it's just, uh, just the way it was. The Brecker brothers had terrible trouble with, with Arista, you know, they, they kind of <laughs> they kind of warned us to stay away, but we were too late by that time. We were deep into it. 